Thank you so much, Margaret. Let us share screens. Hold on, let's do this first. Okay. Okay, you should see in front of you a document that says meditation, Judaism, and self mastery. If not, please speak out. Welcome. So, what are we doing today? We are continuing our deep dive on meditation and self mastery. This is maybe the core. Uh, meditation for not just us Jews, but everybody, meaning um, using a meditative state of mind and a meditative space, so to speak, inside of us to better ourselves. And that, let me tell you, is what the Ramchal is all about. So he um, has a five segment course or series of studies which we're going to be using we're on number four now we'll have number five next week um and he's going to get into some very interesting stuff today we'll also start a, a new chapter with bonte about what's in it for you what exactly happens when you meditate for a long time like what happens to you personally what happens to your experience of life he goes into it in exquisite detail it's very interesting Okay, as you recall, it started out with Rabbi Kaplan in his essay, Meditation and Remolding the Self. And we branched out into uh, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lozato, um, the Ramchal, and because he uh, has a lot to say about this in Mesilat Yesharim or Path of the Just. So, um, as a reminder, the context for what we're learning uh, can be uh, demonstrated with a quote from Yirmiyahu um, that the Ramchal quoted. And the quote is, uh, Jeremiah would bemoan on the evil of his contemporaries affliction with a disease of this trait. They would turn a blind eye to their deeds. Their trait is not being mindful. Um, or as, as the Ramchal calls it, watchfulness, which is a combination of mindfulness, that's the basis of it, and proper programming of yourself to do good, um, to be the right kind of person. Um, and in the Ramchal's eyes, Jeremiah, Yermiahu, would criticize um, his contemporaries' affliction with lack of watchfulness, lack of being mindful combine, combined with self-perfection. They would turn a blind eye to their deeds, not putting heart to consider what they were doing, whether to do or refrain from it. They didn't do any kind of heshbon and nefesh, didn't do any kind of evaluation. Am I on the right track or not? Regarding them, he said, no man regrets of his evil, saying, what have I done? Okay. People aren't asking himself, what are you doing? Um, they would pursue and go by the momentum of habit and conduct, mindlessness. Their mind, they would follow their mind as opposed to their mind following them. And this, they fell into evil. Okay. So today, we will talk about uh, acquiring watchfulness. Again, this state of being mindful and perfecting yourself in that space. Okay, let us go to that. Okay, let's see if we can do it here. Um, good. If you cannot see a document that says Masilat Yasharim, raise your hand. Chapter four, acquiring watchfulness. So again, 
The Ramchal is quite a sage, very deep, um, has the point of view, has multiple points of view. He, he relates the truth of Torah living on a basic level, but he directs it very much towards a very mystical level. Um, and as you'll see from some of the uh, commentators that are brought into play in this commentary on Mesulat Yesharim, um, he, he will take a mystical point of view. Um, I personally only touch on that kind of, so we're not going to uh, dwell on it too much, but it, it should be recognized that, that um, the Ramchal talks about the truth of Torah on multiple levels, which is kind of, which shows what a sophisticated sage he was. Let's continue with watchfulness, in this case, acquiring watchfulness. And the Ramchal says, generally that which brings a person to watchfulness is the study of Torah. As Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair stated in the Barat, uh, Torah brings to watchfulness. But that which in particular brings one to watchfulness is contemplation on the severity of the service which a man is obligated in and the depth of judgment incurred for it. Okay. So he's saying that this attentiveness to watchfulness, again, this state of being mindful and, and being aware of all your various thoughts and aware that you have the option of pursuing the good thoughts or the bad thoughts, but you gotta, you gotta follow the good thoughts. How do you, what is your motivation for following the good thoughts? And where do they come from? He's saying the good thoughts come from the study of Torah and what's the incentive to follow those? Like, why should we follow them? If we're doing meditation and we're mindful of the good, the bad, and the ugly stuff that's going on inside our mind, why wouldn't we want to follow the bad stuff? All right. So he's putting forth argument after argument saying, that's nah, not a good idea. Okay. Um, and how do you know it's a good idea? Well, first of all, um, what happens if you don't? Okay. You realize that you got to follow the good stuff, meaning from the Torah, because you study the events reported in the holy books and from studying the statements of our sages of blessed memory um, about the events of the holy books and um, you, you develop an appreciation for what he calls wholeness of understanding. He uses the word shlemut for this. So this is very interesting. He's using the word shlemut, um, which is translating it as wholeness. And that's a good translation. I mean, we've come across this many times. So as a side point, when we say refua shlema, we're asking for wholeness here. Um, okay, a whole refua. Okay, so he's saying that those people that figure out, yeah, I got to be doing the right thing, are gunning for wholeness. Okay. This reflection has varying degrees of arousing, respectively, for those of wholeness of understanding. You know, you realize wholeness of understanding is important. Okay, but you realize that there's degrees of people. People will take shlemut or wholeness in varying degrees. Not everybody's gonna go for the gusto and want complete wholeness, meaning um, dedicate themselves fully to getting whole. Some people will settle for less and then you have the masses for whatever they do. Okay, so he's, he's, he's behavioral typing Torah students and Torah followers into three categories. Those that go for wholeness, those that go for some lesser wholeness, and some people that just don't bother. Okay. Those of wholeness of understanding who go for the brass ring will be roused to watchfulness by their coming to see clearly that only perfection and nothing else. Um, and again, he's using the word shlemut here for perfection. Wholeness is equated to perfection, both the same words being used here. That's really interesting perfection and wholeness. 
and nothing else is worthy of their desire, and that there is no greater evil than the lack of perfection and distance from it. Ah, so the top five percenters, you might say, that go for the brass ring are realizing there's nothing else to dedicate yourself to. You're going to go for wholeness, wholeness, uh, you're going to go for perfection or shlemut, or that's the only thing to, to shoot for. Nothing else is worth your time and energy. After this has become clear to them, and likewise, after it has become clear to them that the means to perfection are good deeds and traits, they will certainly never consent to diminish these means or be lenient in them. Once you realize that Shlemut is the name of the game and that Shlemut is achieved through good deeds and, and developing proper midot, you're not going to settle for less. Since it has already become clear to them that if they diminish in these means or are weak in these means, not employing the full force necessary, they will not attain the true perfection. If you don't go for the 10, you won't get the 10. Rather, it will be reduced in proportion to their reduction in exerting themselves to the necessary extent, leaving them lacking in perfection, which is a great calamity and great evil to them. These are the kind of people that say, wait a minute, if I don't dedicate all my heart and all my soul and all my might to perfecting myself, I'm going to end up a lesser person, not acceptable. There's no such thing for these people. There's no such thing as like lesser shlemut. Okay. Therefore, they will choose only to maximize these means and to be stringent in all of their details, finding no rest or peace due to worry lest they possibly lack what will bring them to the perfection that they desire. And he quotes Shlomo HaMelech, um, peace be, that says, fortunate is the man that fears always, which our sages explain refers to Torah study. Ah, okay. So um, this, the five percenters of the truly dedicated are going to be really meticulous in how they go about their business because they can't rest otherwise. It's like, you know, it sounds like we're talking about obsessive, obsession and compulsion. I don't know. Um, there's probably a fine line between real chassidut, real dedication and the OCD type approach. I don't know. Um, I'm going to take it at face value and say he's just talking about the truly dedicated here. And it's interesting that the way to stay dedicated, the way to express your dedication, the way to be meticulous about your observance is through what? Torah study. What a novel idea. Okay. And the fear of sin here is basically fear of falling short. The pinnacle of this level called fear of sin, one of the greatest levels, is when a man is constantly afraid and worried lest he have in his hand some trace of sin which obstructs him from the perfection that he is under duty to strive for. Regarding this, our sages of blessed memory said, this teaches each person is burned from the chuppah, the canopy of his fellow, from Baba Batra, this burning does not refer to jealousy, which falls only to people lacking understanding. It is due to seeing oneself lacking from the perfection that he was capable of attaining, just as his fellow had attained. Ah, okay. Okay, now he's starting to do a little transition. So he is saying, he is saying that the the sin the the stress that people feel of these five percenters feel is when they see that they've fallen short from the standards that they feel they're they know they're supposed to be following based on their torah study it's like ah so it's not these are not people we're not using sin here as like um doing a misdeed the sin is falling short in your own eyes of what you're capable of doing Okay, that's point number one, but he's also saying he's bringing in the, what happens when you look to your neighbor and say, ah, I'm not as good as that guy. Ah, 
That's the trap of the people that are striving. Okay. The people with maximum understanding will always be watchful because they are constantly dedicated 24 7 365 to self perfection. But there are people of lesser understanding who are roused to watchfulness according to their perceptions because they crave honor. All right, so he's bringing in the second category of people who are trying to reach for the golden ring, but they're not, because their motivation is not um, self perfection. Their motivation is trying to keep up with the Schwartzes or the Joneses, kind of here. Um, they crave what the other guys got. Okay. For it is evident to every man of faith who believes in reward and punishment, we'll get that in the Lom Haba, that the various levels in the world of truth, meaning the world to come, are according to one's level of deeds, and that one is only elevated over his fellow if his deeds are greater than his fellows. But one is of who is a few deeds will be the lower one. If so, how could a man hide his eye from his deeds or slacken his striving and attaining this trait of wildfulness? For afterwards, certainly he will suffer at the time he can no longer rectify what he made crooked. All right, so again, he's talking about two things, I think. One is the people that are striving for self-perfection are never going to stop. How could they slack off? Um, they're going to slack off, as he says later, when we die. This is, a, this is a lifetime pursuit. The only reason, the only way you cease and desist from striving to be perfect or perfecting yourself is when you're dead. Okay, but there are some people who are going to say who will settle for less. Who are these people? There are some simpletons who seek only to lighten the burden on themselves. They reply, why should we weary ourselves with so much piety and separation? Is it not sufficient for us to not be among the wicked sentenced to Gehanim? We will not strain ourselves just to enter into the innermost chambers of Gan Eden. If we don't have a large portion, at least we will have a small portion. This is enough for us. We will not further burden the yoke of our load just for this. All right, so we're in the category of people now who are saying, why not settle for second best? Why make this an obsession? Why make this a 24 seven dedication? Hey, we don't have to have the gold ring. Let's go for the bronze. What's wrong with that? Okay. Well, According to one commentary, their view is that the need for watchfulness, again, watch, watchfulness meaning being mindful, and um, within your mindfulness, self-perfecting. It's that kind of watchfulness, they say, is only for one who wants to be a chassid or a, or a, a pious ascetic, ascetic man, but in order not you know, you don't necessarily want to be, you want to, you don't want to be those guys, but you also don't want to be a Russia, a wicked man. Okay, I'll be in the middle. I won't be the best, but I'm not going to be the worst. Why isn't that good enough? Okay. That seems to be the attitude as characterized by the Ramchal. And he continues, there is just one question that we will put to these people. Can they so easily tolerate in this fleeting world the sight of one of their peers being honored and elevated above them and coming to rule over them? Or worse still, if this is one of their servants or one of the beggars, which are lowly and despicable in their eyes, would they not be filled with pain? And would their blood not boil inside them? Surely they could not. Ah, okay. What's the catch? What's the pitfall of somebody who wants to take like, well, I'll just take, you know, I'll settle, I'll be, I'll settle for mediocrity. And I won't be the best, I won't be the worst. The Ram Khal is characterizing these people as being susceptible to envy and jealousy because, all right, they're going to be settling for less, but he's kind of saying inside they know that's not so good. And as soon as they find somebody better than them, they're going to be like, ah, why can't I be like him? 
And what happens if there's somebody that's better than them is somebody they consider themselves to be better than, you know, as he's saying, a servant or a beggar, whoever you think you're better than, if you're settling for mediocrity, as soon as, if somebody of what you think is a lower position than you proves himself to have better midot and more dedication than you, oh, you're going to be in, you're going to kick yourself in the you know what. They would, would they not be filled with pain and would their blood not boil inside them? Okay. That's the trap, as the Ramchal describes it. If you're not going for the gold ring and you're just going for the bronze, you're going to feel that somebody else is showing you up. You know what? I think he's right. For behold, we can see with our own eyes that all of a man's labor is to raise himself over anyone he can and to establish his place among those more elevated. This is jealousy between man and his fellow. For if he sees his fellow being elevated while he remains lowly, certainly what he tolerates would only be what is forced to tolerate because of his inability to prevent it, but his heart will rot within him. Due to the great suffering and sadness is the commentary. How can they tolerate seeing themselves lower than those same people who are now their inferiors? And this is in the place of true levels and eternal worth. Okay. There, suff there is no doubt that their suffering in this will be great and everlasting. I think it's a pretty solid insight into human nature. That's right. If you don't try to go for the best yourself, and see you see somebody else going for it yourself um inside you're going to know that ah, i'm settling ah, i'm settling ah, i'm settling and it's going to bug you and then it's going to come full force out at you when you when somebody in your own eyes shows you up that's definitely going to be a problem and that's why people shoot the messenger okay Hence, this tolerance, which they adopt in order to lighten on themselves the severity of the service, is but a false enticement which their evil inclination employs to entice them, and no basis whatever, with no basis whatsoever in truth. Ah, so this tolerance, this attitude of, well, I don't have to be the best, but I don't, uh, at least I'm not the worst, this tolerance of yourself, he's describing as a trap. Hold on, just listen, please. Right. Um, okay, and it's governed by the evil inclination. And remember, the evil inclination is your mind run amok, at least as I'm understanding it. Okay. You're going to really get down on yourself. Ah. He is unable to refute the Yetzer, rather they do not seek to find their error, for due to their desire to make things easier for themselves, they don't investigate whether they are erring. Okay, they're unable to refute, their mind is run amok, they're filling with their thoughts of jealousy and all their the bad meat out that they've cultivated somehow inside of them, that they should be trying to overcome, but that's what's conquering them. And they haven't developed the skills to say, wait a minute, that's not how I should be thinking. And here he makes a point of there's really no choice because time can run out. This is what King Shlomo, peace be unto him, referred to when he said, in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, whatever your hand finds to do with your power, do it. For there is no deed, nor account, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the Sha'al, the down under place where you are going. There is no wisdom or knowledge or account down there. The explanation is that what a man can do while the power is granted in his hands by the Creator, namely, the power of free will granted to him all the days of his life with which he chooses and is commanded to do, he will not be able to do more in the grave and the pit. So this free will that we have to say, I'm going to choose this thought over that thought, this deed over that deed, 
doesn't you don't have that free will anymore when you're dead you can't do it from the grave okay so this power of free will will no longer be in his hands thus for one who has failed to do many good deeds in his lifetime it is impossible for him to do them afterwards since he no longer has free will after death and he who did not make an accounting of his deeds while alive will no longer have the opportunity to do so then and he who has not become wise in this world will not become wise in the grave time will run out and i think this implies although he's not stating it but i think this implies that you will somehow your soul whatever will feel regret as i'm not doing it while you're alive i think that's the problem because if you didn't have that 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 consequence of regretting not doing it so what you die and you didn't make this hash bone you didn't make this accounting for yourself so what you died mediocre so what so i i think by implication that means um somehow there's going to be a regret and suffering that you didn't take advantage of the opportunity to exercise your free will and make the right choices while you're alive he doesn't say it much but i think that's pretty apparent but this brings us to the third category again the first category is the people that go for the gold ring and dedicate themselves to perfecting themselves 24 7 and the second group are the people that say well i'm not going to be the best but at least i'm not the worst what's the third group the general masses the general masses will be aroused to watchfulness again watchfulness is being mindful and making the choice to choose the good stuff and perfect yourself with it um they will be roused to watchfulness through the matter of reward and punishment upon recognizing the extent of the depth of judgment on this in truth it is it is proper to continually shudder in fear okay okay the third one what's in it for me the third group is like well what how am I, how am i going to benefit or not benefit if i make the right choices notice in the first category the people going for the gold ring the five percenters they're like well i do it because that's my job and clearly that's there's no other choice but to do good stuff this third group is like well how much are you going to pay me or what's the penalty if i don't okay 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 and he quotes some gemara that talks about um people who don't receive the shechina when you you know there's there's certain repercussions um for doing it that way um okay and there's a tr commentary that makes an interesting point about the idea of punishment you know what is punishment what are you afraid of what will happen if you don't make the right choices okay note that punishment is a consequence of the severity of man's actions not as a revenge by god Whew. all right you know and that's actually a good point to make because people tend to all right what's god going to do to me he's going to strike me down with lightning well i did something bad i'm not struck by lightning so what uh no it's not so simple for God has granted man vast powers, as explained in the book of Nevishachayim. Man's thoughts, words, and actions either create or destroy higher mystical words. Each mitzvah or sin by man even creates a conscious spiritual being. And he gives a text source for this. Thus, the punishment in the next world is a kind of rectification, not as a revenge. God. All right, this is in the realm where. You got me, but basically the repercussions of making the bad choices affect higher levels of existence and um, somehow you've got to deal with um, 
these mystical worlds and even spiritual beings that are somehow um, created when you do good or bad. This is beyond the scope of this particular of me, um, but it's it's interesting to understand. But the point here is not like this simplistic struck down by lightning things. There are repercussions of what we do in this world in another world, which I guess somehow we will inhabit when we die. And wouldn't you like it to be a nice place? It's like, you know, wouldn't you like your vacation village home to be a nice place? Um, okay. And he makes the point, um, having quoted Psalms, that the Holy One, blessed be he, scrutinizes judgment on his pious ones to the degree of a hair's breadth. And he gives a bunch of examples about Avraham Avinu and Yaakov and Yosef and David, Michal, Kizkiyahu, all the rich and famous in Tanakh um, experience what we would consider to be not too much slack by Hakadosh Baruch Hu because um, their, their deeds, they were at that level where ju God judged them scrupulously. Okay, where to the way that's efficient. And one of the commentary makes the point saying, well, you know, little deeds um, are accounted for. They're, they're in the reckoning. Uh, a little a small sin could upset the balance. A small um, mitzvah can regain the balance. Okay, one final point, which is really interesting. And again, so, so we have three groups, the 5%ers that go for the gold ring and are totally dedicated to self-perfection 24, 7, 3, 6, 5. The middle group who are like, well, you know, I'm not gonna be the best, but at least I'm not the worst. And the third group is like, well, I'm interested, but, um, what are the costs and benefits here? Is it really worth it? Okay. Um, he makes a final point about mercy because in all three cases, people are going to be judged. Um, and how, what is the judgment all about? And he says that the trade of mercy is certainly factored into the judgment that we get when we make these decisions about how good we should be. Um, and he actually says that mercy is the, the pillar of the world. Um, it, justice is not negated, um, but mercy tempers the justice. Because if mercy was not around, the sinner would be punished immediately for a sin without any delay. The punishment would be wrathful because he'd be a rebel and there'd be no possible repair for whatever. Okay, so, you know, during the Yamim Narayim, we're, we're working for mercy here because, it, because we say that if it was just pure judgment, poof, you know, everybody would be fried because of the severity of our sins. So we try to up the ante and, and rebalance the scales with good stuff, you know, the shoe with the feel of tzedakah, so that we get as much mercy as possible. And when we get the mercy, what happens? It reverses the three affirmations matters. It grants the sinner time, and he's not eradicated from the earth immediately upon sinning. The punishment does not immediately destroy him. And the opportunity of repentance is granted as a complete kindness. Okay. Now here he says something which is remarkable, 
so let's wrestle with it for a second. He actually says, when the penitent recognizes his sin and admits it and reflects on his evil, repents of it, and completely regrets ever having done it, as he would regret in annulling a certain vow, you know, like at the beginning of Yom Kippur, we annul these vows with Kol Nidre. That's a nullification here. And here, I guess, the same thing can do with your sin. In which case there is complete regret and he desires and longs that his deed never be committed and pains himself strongly that the matter was done and renounces it for the future and flees from it. Then the uprooting of the deed from his will is counted to him as the annulment of a vow and he gains atonement for it. The sin is actually removed from existence and uprooted through his painting himself and regretting in the present what he had done in the past. Okay, of course, I can hear you guys thinking, well, what about this if it's involving a man? Don't you have to go and apologize and make whole what you did? You know, I, that's the Ramchal. Could not explain this to you, but maybe at some point we can wrestle with it. Okay. Okay. So, in summary here, we've got, we've talked about watchfulness, and again, watchfulness is the combination of being mindful so that you're fully aware of the good, the bad, and the ugly that's churning inside of you, and Torah study so that you are educating yourself you are programming yourself so that you have a biased way towards the good stuff. And once you do that, though, people make decisions as to, to what extent they're going to commit to the good stuff. And the Ramkhal said there's the three groups, the gold, the silver, and the bronze rings. Um, but be aware that there's a consequence for making your choice as to which group you belong to. Um, because you're going to be judged. Um, and that's why he explains the top 5%ers, the people that go for the gold, realize like there's no choice here. I, I got to go for the gusto here because I want as favorable a judgment as possible. And then, though, the Ramchal said, you know, even those people that choose the silver and brass rings, they got a chance here, but you know what it's going to take to, to rectify having made a bunch of sins when you really didn't need to do that? It's going to take this real sophisticated, advanced process of working on yourself to the point where the sin is like not existent in this world. That's a workload. Um, Lots of luck, but Ram Khal says you could do it. Okay, we will finish <clears throat> the watchfulness segment next week. Detriments of watchfulness, the Ram Khal, and then we'll go on to Maxwell Maltz and put all this stuff in more plain English and relatable terms. But I wanted to give the Torah point of view on this first. Okay, looking at the time. We're going to use Bonte next week. So, Margaret, please flick that switch.